بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره نعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار. Okay, today we start uh, Hadith number 14 in An Nawawi's 40 Hadith, and this Hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud رضي الله عنه, and he said, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said. لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث that it is not permissible or the, the blood of a Muslim man is not permissible meaning to be taken except in one of three situations then the messenger explained الثيب الزاني والنفس بالنفس والتارك لدينه المفارق للجماعة so he explained the athayyib, which is a married person who's consummated the marriage, uh, who commits adultery. <coughs> and a soul for a soul, or a life for a life. And the one who abandons his religion and separates from the jama'ah, separates from the jama'ah of the Muslims. This is reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And the Shaykh, so we're going to go through uh, Shaykh Salih al Shaykh's explanation first, insha'Allah. And so the Shaykh begins by saying that this hadith, uh, this is the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. And within this hadith, he's simply, or there's a mention of the things on account of which the blood of a Muslim person becomes lawful, it becomes halal to be taken. And the Shaykh says, we've already looked at previously uh, in another hadith which occurs uh, at, at the beginning of an nawawis 40 hadith, which is the hadith in which the Prophet wasallam <coughs> said that I have been ordered to fight against the people up until they testify that none has a right to be worship, worshipped except Allah alone, that Muhammad uh, is the messenger of Allah that they establish the prayer, give the zakah, and if they do that, then their blood and their wealth is protected or guaranteed or, or, or protected from me. Unless it is due to a right of Islam, and their reckoning is with Allah. So, in other words, in a previous hadith, we established that a person, it was established that, a Muslim, that the blood of a Muslim is protected. Right? It is inviolable, meaning that it cannot be taken and it is protected. And what is it that protects the blood of a Muslim? It is that he testifies that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah. And he establishes the prayer, gives the zakah. So this means that the, the person whose blood is protected is the one who affirms Allah's right to be worshipped alone and who fulfills the right of that testimony. So not only does he make the testimony that Allah has a right to be worshipped alone, that Muhammad is a messenger of Islam, but on top of that he fulfills the rights of that statement. And from the rights of that statement is that he establishes the prayer and you know he, he gives uh, the zakah. So in other words, he's fulfilling the rights of Tawheed. So after affirming Tawheed, he fulfills the rights of Tawheed. So a person, when he fulfills this uh, requirement, and he becomes a Muslim, and a Muslim who fulfills the requirements of, of, of Tawheed, then his blood is protected, and his wealth is haram. It is unlawful for his wealth to be taken, unlawfully. And then the Shaykh says, so that's the, the hadith that we looked at previously, and this hadith, which is the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, anhu, this hadith explains those specific 
situations in which the blood of a Muslim who is a muwahid, so he's a Muslim who is upon Tawheed, the situations in which his blood can be taken or his blood can be can be spilled legally and lawfully. So this is even though he is testifying that none has a right to be worshipped and he testifies that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and he, and he brings the various rights of uh, this kalima, then still <coughs> uh, there are situations in which his blood can be taken. And this is the hadith which explains that. So the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم So he began by saying that لا يحل meaning it is not lawful. It's not lawful, meaning it is haram. And this would mean that a person who unlawfully takes the blood of another Muslim, that this is a major sin. It is a major sin if a person makes permissible the blood of another Muslim without any due right, without, without it falling into one of those specific situations in which the Sharia allows the taking or the spilling of a blood of a Muslim. So therefore, the fact that the Messenger said, لا يحلو, it is not halal, meaning it is haram, then to fall in that sin makes it uh, a major, a major sin. And this is why in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, لا ترجئوا بعد كفارا يضرب بعد, uh, بعدكم أعناق, أعناق بعد. Uh, do not, the Messenger said, do not become disbelievers after me. Striking the necks of one another. So in other words, in this hadith, the messenger, the messenger Ali Salam, has made the you know the, the the striking of one Muslim against another, or the fighting of one Muslim against another, or the killing of one Muslim against another. He's described it as being uh, one of the attributes of the people of disbelief. Why? Because he said, "Do not become kuffar after me." Now this this doesn't mean that a person who kills another Muslim is a kafir. This is not what the hadith means. This this hadith means that do not <coughs> do not have the traits and the characteristics of the kuffar by attacking and killing one another. Right. So the scholars explain that this hadith refer means that these are the traits and the characteristics of the kuffar. So the messenger is saying, do not become like them. Do not become like them. It does not mean that if a Muslim kills another Muslim, he is a kafir. This does not mean mean that at all. Rather, it means that these are from the attributes and the characteristics of the people of Kufr. And likewise, in another hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained, إِذَا الْتَقَ الْمُسْلِمَانِ بِسَيْفَيْهِمَا بِسَيْفَيْهِمَا فَالْقَاتِلُ وَالْمَقْتُولُ فِي النَّارِ So the Messenger said that when two Muslims meet together with their swords, then the one who killed and the one who was killed are both in the fire. And so the so they said, Qalu, Ya Rasulullah, Had al Qatilu Fuma Balul Maktul. They said, Oh Messenger of Allah, okay, this is the one who kills. We understand that. But what what crime is upon the one who was killed? What about the one who was killed? So he said, Inhu innahu kana harisan ala qatli sahibihi. So the Messenger of Allah said that indeed he was eager and desirous of killing his companion. So the the Sheikh then says, commenting upon this, he says, this this proves that anyone who strives to kill a Muslim, and then he used the various ways and means by which a Muslim can be killed, then that person is in the fire. Why? Because the Messenger said, "Falqatilu wal maktulu fi nar." That the one who killed, the killer and the killed, are both in the fire, and. The Sheikh says, so this hadith, it means that a person who strives to kill his Muslim brother, he is not excused. He is not excused. He will be taken to account. He will be called to account. Why? Because this person, even though he was the one killed, he had a, a desire and a concern in his mind uh, to kill the other person. Right? Meaning he, he had a ham, he had uh, this, this concern and this desire and this intent to kill, kill the other person. And 
The Shaykh then mentions another hadith. He says, look, we have some other hadith in which the Messenger وسلم, said, إِذَا حَمَّ عَبْدِي بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا 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 تَكْتَبُوهَا عَلِيهِ عَلِيهِ That's what, that's what it says. فَلَا تُكْتَبْ عَلِيهِ This is what it says in, in, in the book. So, uh, when, when, when a servant, or when my ser- servant, إِذَا حَمَّ عَبْدِي بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا تُكْتَبْ عَلِيهِ there's, there's a mistake in, in the text. It says, "Fala, fala, taktu, tabuha." It says, "Taking error." In the book, "Fala, fala, taktu, buha, alay." Do not try. It. Do not account it on yeah. the name. But if you look, it says, "Yeah, because the hamma, the mean hamma. My servant, yeah, my servant. Yeah, no, no, yeah. mean hamma does not do it. Oh yeah, no, he thinks to do I, it. Like in hala, fala, fala, taktu, buha. Do not taktu. فلا تكتبوها. This is order to to yeah. the ملائكة. Yeah. فلا تكتبوها. Yeah. Yeah. So the hadith when when my servant إذا حمى عبدي when my servant he he thinks of doing an evil deed then do not write it. And this is a command to the angels to not to to not write it. Okay. Now a person might think that this appears to be a contradiction. That in the hadith in the first hadith. The, it is stated that both the one who killed and the one who was killed are in the fire. Why? Because he was eager to kill his, his companion. But in this hadith, we, we find that the, mes- the, 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 the messenger says uh, in, in the hadith that when a, when a servant of mine intends or thinks of doing an evil, then do not write it. So the Sheikh says, uh, and then after, in fact, there's another hadith as well on top of this. In another hadith in which the Messenger sallallahu uh, said that indeed Allah has forgiven this ummah for whatever it occurs in its soul. Meaning that whatever a person thinks of doing in their souls, so long as they do not act on it or speak it. So long as they don't do it or speak it. Right? So in other words, Allah will pardon this ummah. <coughs> For all of the things that they think about, they think about doing a sin or an evil or think about saying something which is sinful or evil. But so long as they don't do it and they don't speak it, then Allah will overlook them and will, will pardon them. Okay, so now how do we, you know, how do, how do we bring these hadith together? So the Shaykh says uh, that the hadith that we mentioned at the beginning, that the one who killed and the one who was killed are both in the fire. The reason is, is that even though the one who was killed didn't manage to kill the other person, he still used all of the ways and means that he had at his disposal, uh, uh, that he had at his disposal, to try and kill the other person. Right. So, so in other words, he had the sword and then he used his skill and whatever else to try and kill the person. Right. However, even though in his irada he wanted to kill the person, it just happened that Allah from his decree and from his qadr did not decree that that should happen. Right? So Allah hadn't decreed that this person will kill that other person. However, that person still used all of the ways and the means right, to try and fulfill his objective. So he took his sword, he met with the person, he then took you know strikes and blows and whatever and he used his his strategy his technique his skill to try and achieve his objective right so in other words he made use of the asbab he took the ways and the means and it just so happened that it wasn't written in in, in the decree and it wasn't from al qadr that he should fulfill his objective so this person he you know he will still enter into uh, the fire he will still enter into the fire why because he is he will be treated as someone who actually did the sin itself. Right? Because he strove, used all of his means, used everything at his disposal to try and achieve his objective. But it just so happened that Allah hadn't written it for him. But nevertheless, he would be treated the same as the one, as the one who actually did the sin. And so therefore, they will be the same in terms of the, the, the burden of sin upon them. The Shaykh says, even the person who is pleased with a sin is just like the one who does the sin. Right? Even from, from, from the point of view of having the, the, the sin upon him. And the Shaykh says that this is very clear from the evidences. 
that, that we've looked at. Just to add, you know, add, add to that, it's like, for example, if a person, uh, you know, desired to, for example, commit a major sin, like he wanted to gamble or he wanted to drink, for example, and then he used all of the ways and means, like, you know, uh, trying to travel to the place of gambling or trying to save money or acquire money or steal money or whatever else it was to go and, you know, uh, fall into a sin of gambling or or, or, or his, you know, uh, w drinking or whatever it was and he tried all the ways and means, right, and then, you know, he bought the drink as well and then eventually maybe he lost it or it was forgotten or it was stolen from him. So he went through all these processes and at the very end it just so happened that he wasn't able to commit that sin that person would be treated the same as the one who did, uh, you know, drink alcohol, or who did gamble, or who, or, or who did commit whatever action it was, right? If he went through, if he used all of the ways and means, and strove and tried, but it just so happened that it wasn't decreed for him, then that person is the same as the one who actually uh, did the sin. And so the Sheikh added to this as well, that a person who actually is pleased with a sin, Right, so he's pleased in his heart. He, you know, he uh, gambling pleases him, or you know, the, the stealing ple or whatever. He's pleased with the sin. Then again, the burden of sin would be the same upon him as the one who actually did it. So rather, a Muslim should hate in his heart. He should hate hate uh, these actions in his heart. Okay. Next, the, the Shaykh continues and says here that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث. So the fact that the messenger said that the blood of a Muslim man is impermit is unlawful except in three situations. This proves how great the honor and the blood of a Muslim is, meaning his inviolability, meaning that the that the fact that his his honor and his uh, this is a word used in English, inviolability, meaning that this is something that can never ever be transgressed. You can never ever transgress into the the honor and the you know the the, the the blood of another of another Muslim. And this hadith establishes and proves the great status of the of the of the inviolability of a, of the blood of a Muslim. And here, notice that the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Muslim, the Mumri'in Muslim, and the intent here is the Muslim who fulfills the rights of Islam. Right. So pay attention to this: the Muslim who fulfills the rights of Islam. For example, meaning that the one who became a Muslim in reality, not the one who became a Muslim just upon a claim. Right. So we mean here the person who testifies that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah, and the one who testifies that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah and he brings Tawheed. He affirms Tawheed and he acts upon the rights of Tawheed. This is the one that we are speaking about. As for the one who is a mushrik, right, the one who, um, you know, who, he commits major shirk, or the one who falls into an innovation, but this innovation is of such a level that it is disbelief and it takes him outside the fold of Islam, then these likes of people, the, the, these types of people are not, they don't enter into uh, Islam. They're, they're, not, they're not described with Islam in accordance with this hadith. Uh, and this is because, as we've established, a Muslim is the one who practices Tawheed, he establishes Tawheed, so he brings the Shahadatain, and then whatever follows on from that, like from the uh, the Salah and the Zakah and from the pillars and at the same time to not worship anything besides Allah he keeps away from all of that this is the Muslim that we're speaking of as for those that, that we find these people who claim they are Muslim you know who testify that none has a right to be worshipped except Allah and then they go to the grave of Badawi or they go to the grave of this one or that one in whichever land it might be and then they go there and they call upon them and they seek aid from them, they seek assistance from them and they fear them and they hope in them, right? And they you know, give these actions of worship to these, you know, uh, besides Allah. These people, don't they, they don't enter into this hadith. They don't enter into the description of Islam that is being affirmed in this hadith for, you know, for a person who is a, a muwahid, right? So to make that clear that the Messenger said, لَا يَحِلُّ دَمُمْرِئٍ مُسْلِمٍ 
Muslim, Muslim. And a Muslim is the one who brings the shahadatain and who fulfills the rights of uh, Tawheed. So the Sheikh says, uh, then he says, Illa bi ihda thalathin, except on account of three things. And so the Sheikh says, the Sheikh then just goes into some grammatical uh, issues uh, about, uh, he says, I'll quickly you know, summarize them. He says, uh, first of all, he says that the fact that an exception has been made, la yahillu da mumri'in illa bi ihda thalath. So the messenger made an exception. So he said, in general, first, the blood of a Muslim is not is not lawful. So this shows that the messenger has said absolutely that the blood of a Muslim is not lawful. He then said he then made an exception, and he accepted from that three things. Right. So in other words, this is the, the way the, the way we look at this is that in general it's completely forbidden to take the blood of a Muslim, but the messenger just made three exceptions, three exceptions uh, from this. And that, three, and that these three exceptions are comprehensive. They cover, they, cover, they cover all of the instances in which the blood of a Muslim can be taken, as we shall see in, in the explanation, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, the second point that the Sheikh makes is again another grammatical issue. Is he said, if you look at this hadith, you find that the messenger said, La yahillo. Right? So it's, he didn't issue a command, right? He didn't say, do not take the blood of a Muslim, but he said it in terms of a description. He said, the blood of a Muslim is unlawful. Right? So think about it. There's a, there's a difference in the way that the messenger said it. He could have said, do not take the blood of a Muslim. Right? So he's, he's commanding the ummah. Do not take the blood of a Muslim except in three situations. He didn't say that. He, just, he said it in the form of uh, a description, it, meaning it is not permissible to take the blood of a Muslim. It's like, if you, let me give you another example that the Shaykh brings. The Shaykh says, like in the Quran, Allah says, uh, regarding the, it's like the, uh, you know, the, the lawhul mahfuz, Allah says, لا يمسه, لا يمسه إلا المطحرون, That none touch it except those who are pure. Right, talking about the preserved tablet. Right, so here, Allah didn't say, do not touch it unless you are the, 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 the pure. Allah just said it as by way of a description. None touch it except those who are pure. So the Shaykh is saying that this is something that we find in the book and in the Sunnah. And it's, it's something that's used in order to very strongly emphasize a prohibition. So even though the words weren't directly used that would, that would indicate a prohibition, like the messenger didn't say do not take the blood of a Muslim, right? He's, he's said it in a way, which is, la, you know, like in the way which occurs in the hadith. And this is a form of emphasis, which is more uh, strong than using a direct uh, prohibition, right? So this is like a grammatical thing that the Sheikh is mentioning. And he says that we find examples of this in, you know, in the Quran and, you know, and, and in other places. He says this is a principle that's well known in the Arabic language, that in order to emphasize something, you, just, you, you describe it in this manner rather than use the command itself. So he makes that point, and we move on. And then he goes on to look at the three specific examples that are the three specific exceptions that were made. The first one is, the first of these three, us, three usul or three foundations is, Athayyibuzani. Athayyibuzani. And the Sheikh says, this refers to, you know, the adulterer. And the Sheikh explains that the one who commits fornication, he will have a number of different uh, situations. The first situation is that this person who falls into a fornication, he is described as someone being a thayyib. And the thayyib means someone who's already, you know, he's already experienced like sexual intercourse. Right? So in other words, this person... He has been married with a legitimate and valid and uh, Sharia marriage. So it has to be valid and legitimate in terms of the Sharia. All right, with all of its conditions and everything else. And this person, obviously, he's consummated the marriage. So this person is called a thayyib. A thayyib. And you know, to, to put it in English, we would say that this, this is a person who is a married and non-virgin. 
right? A, a person who's married and consummated his marriage. This is who, one who is described as being a thayyib. And so this person, when, when, uh, when, uh, yeah, so this person we call him a thayyib, and uh, we, we, oh yeah, and then the sheikh says, if a person did not, was not married, and he committed fornication, this person would not be considered to be thayyib. Right, so let's, let's make this clear. A person is only considered to be a thayyib in the sharia is that when he's gone through a legitimate sharia nikah, a legitimate marriage which is valid and sahih, fulfills all the conditions, and then he consummates the marriage within, you know, within the marriage, then this person is thayyib. As for if a person wasn't already married, he committed fornication, right, so he's experienced, you know, sexual intercourse, this person is not a thayyib. Is not considered to be thayyib. Um, and like, likewise, for example, if he fell into like the mut'a marriage, you know, the mut'a marriage, the temporary marriage that the Shia fall into, where they marry someone for like three days and then they divorce them after three days or whatever. Likewise, if a person was to was to do a mut'a marriage, and then obviously, you know, have relations, this still would not make him a thayyib. This would not make him a thayyib. So, in other words, the point being. That a person is only a thayyib and a muhsin, a thayyib, uh, when he is married with a valid, sound nikah, which fulfills the conditions, and then he consummates a marriage. That is a thayyib. So if a thayyib, if this person then commits fornication, right, he, you know, in other words, he commits adultery, then this person's blood is permissible to be taken and the Shaykh says that in the Quran that initially in the Quran there was a verse revealed within which uh, the ruling for the prescribed punishment was contained right and this is the verse that that wasn't that was that was revealed as part of the Quran and this is a verse that the Shaykh mentions that it reads you know that the was Shaykh to either Zaniya so he mentions the text of the verse and then he says however this verse was abrogated in its wording but the ruling that it contained was retained in the sharia right so even though the wording of the quran of, of, of this verse was abrogated and not kept from the Quran, the actual ruling that it brought was retained in the Sharia. And that ruling is established in other hadith, in other, you know, in, 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 in other hadith in the Sunnah. And then the Shaykh says that, that this verse was replaced by another verse, which is this verse here, Azaniyatu wa Zani Fajlidu Kulla Wahid Minhuma Mi'ata Jalda. That the fornicator and the fornicatress then strike, you know, uh, lash them, each of them, with 100 uh, lashes. So the Sheikh says that the first verse was abrogated in its wording, but the ruling was retained. That the ruling was uh, retained. And the Sheikh says, likewise, the Sunnah, when we look in the Sunnah, we find that in the Sunnah it proves and establishes the stoning. And likewise, in, we, we, there's also evidence or some, some of the people, what they do is that when they find someone who's committed adul adultery, they lash them first and they stone them as well. So they combine the two things together. And the Sheikh says, this is why there's a difference amongst the scholars and they say that the one who is a thayyib, uh, the one who commits adultery, who is a thayyib, <coughs> then should we combine in such a person, the lashing and the stoning. And so some of the scholars said, well, yes, you know, we do. And some of the scholars said, well, no, we don't, because the, you know, it's, the, the stoning is, is, is specific for the, for the adultery, for a thayyib. And we find in the sunnah that the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that he only used, for example, in, in some of the instances in which people were stoned, he only did the stoning. 
So, for example, the example given of Ma is uh, and, and a female called Al Ghamidiya. And likewise, uh, there was a Jew and a Jewess who were, who were likewise stoned. And other examples like this where uh, the stoning was done without the lashing. And some of the Sahaba though, like Ali radiallahu anhu, we find that from his practice that he would uh, lash first and then stone. Like he did in an example that is documented in Sahih al-Bukhari, that he, you know, he lashed a, a, a fornicator, a married fornicator, an adulterer, and then had him stoned. And then he said, uh, you know, that I, 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 I lashed him with the Book of Allah and stoned him with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. So meaning that the, that the lashing is in the Qur'an and the stoning is, is, is in the Sunnah. And uh, then the Shaykh continues and he says uh, that, uh, that many of the people of knowledge, what they do is that they just limit themselves to just stoning. So if they find an adulterer, a married adulterer, then all they do is they stick to the, stick to the uh, 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 stoning because that is what is found in uh, the Sunnah. And there are many examples of that. And then he says some other scholars, what they do is they might combine between lashing and stoning if the Imam sees that this is a measure that will have a more pronounced effect and you know, you know, to, to emphasize the severity and the graveness of this sin. So, and so that the society you know, uh, keeps away from it. So this is up to the Imam whether he wants to do this or not. In any case, in any case, before stoning is done, then the conditions have to be fulfilled, right? The conditions have to be fulfilled. And those conditions are that there has to be four eyewitnesses, right? There have to be four eyewitnesses who catch the person in the act. This is one condition. Or the other condition can be if the person admits himself. So he comes to the Imam, he comes to whatever, and he says, look, I, I admit and I, I confess to the action of adultery. Right? So, so if, if either of these two are fulfilled, then that person must be, must be stoned. This, you cannot go back. If he admits and he persists, he, you know, I admit, and I, then... Once that's established, then the stoning must be must must be done. Or if there's four witnesses, then the person must be <coughs> must be stoned. Right? There's no going back because now this now has now become from the, from the rights of Allah that His hudud <coughs> be established, and so none can repel it, and no one can uh, withhold withhold from it once these conditions are fulfilled. Uh, and and this would apply even up until that person dies. Right? So if if he uh, admitted it, right? then it would be a sin for the people not to fulfill it upon him. And the, the had punishment can be fulfilled upon him for as, for as long as he lives. So even if it was like 10 years down the line that this guy had already admitted that I've done such and such and such and such, then that had still, still uh, can, you know, can and should be applied to him. So, uh, to summarize this one then, a Thayyib Uzali person who's married, been through the nikah legitimately, whatever, then he commits, then he's consummated the marriage, and then he falls into uh, this, this sin, then his, his blood becomes permissible. The second one, a nafs of nafs, which is a soul for a soul, or a life for a life. And this is based in the Quran, in which Allah the Most High said, وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِالنَّفْسِ that we wrote, that we prescribed for them therein, that a soul for a soul, meaning a life for a life. And likewise, in, a, in another ayah, Allah the Most High says, كُتِبَ عَلِيكُمُ الْقِسَاسِ الْقِسَاسُ فِي الْقَتْلَ الْحُرُّ بِالْحُرُّ وَالْعَبْدُ بِالْعَبْدُ وَالْعُنْثَى بِالْعُنْثَى That it is being prescribed upon you, the law of retribution. Al-Qisas, retribution. Al, uh, the free person for the free person, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. And so this, the Shaykh says that this verse has proven that, that the soul should be killed for, a, for taking a soul. So when one person, he transgresses over another person, 
which whose life has been protected and guarded in the Sharia, then that person should be should be killed. Right? When that person killed deliberately and on purpose and with intent. He deliberately intended to kill. If that if that's established, then that person's soul can be can be taken. And the Sheikh then goes on to raise an issue. Now there's an issue here that the scholars raise, which is that is this command one soul for another soul? Is it general? Does it apply for every type of soul? Or is it restricted and very specific? So the Sheikh says that the most correct view and the view that all that the majority of the people of knowledge are upon is that when Allah says, uh, when the Messenger says, Al Nafsu bin Nafs, and when Allah says in the Quran, Al Hurru bil Hur, Wal Abdu bil Abd, Wal Untha bil Untha, which is the free person for the free person, the slave for the slave, and the, the female for the female, he says that this is restricted. In other words, it means that w w when, when we say that a life for a life, it doesn't mean that this is general and applies to everybody unrestrictedly. Rather, there are, it, it, it is restricted. So this shows, and then the Shaykh goes on to explain. For example, in the Sunnah, in the Sunnah it's explained that a Muslim is not to be killed on account of a kafir. Right? So, here's one example where this, where this rule doesn't apply. A Muslim is not killed on account of a kafir. And likewise, a person who is a free person is not killed on account of a slave. So, if a free person killed a slave, then that free person's life is not taken on account of the slave. As a second example. And... Uh, so the point being that there has to be in an equality in the status of the two people, right? So that their status has to be equal, Muslim and a Muslim. Muslim kills a Muslim, then that first Muslim's life can be taken if he did it deliberately with intent, with purpose. A slave kills a slave, then the killing slave, his life can be taken, right? Uh, a free person kills a free person, likewise, female kills a female, likewise. Right, so the status has to be has to be equal, and then so then the Sheikh says so therefore this this mukafa'a, which means that the equality in terms of the religion, and in terms of the status as to whether a person is a, is a slave or not, then all of that has to be established. All of that has to be uh, established, and he says that this is what is established in the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. Al-Hurru bil hur to the end of the verse. And likewise, this is what is established in the Sunnah as well. As for the, this thing about taking the life for another life in general, he says this is in opposition to, to the Sunnah. Even though the Shaykh says some of the, like for example, Imam Abu Hanifa, he was of the view that a Muslim can be killed for the life of a kafir, and you know because of the verse which is general in the Quran that we that we wrote upon them that a, that a life for a life, and likewise, he also had the view that a free person can be killed on account of the life of a slave, and so on and so forth. The Sheikh says even though some of the people uh, held this view, he said the majority of the scholars are of the view that these ahadith and this verse is restricted, in the sense, in in the way that we explained it before, right that. A Muslim can't be killed on account of a kafir, and a free person can't be killed on account of a slave. So this ends our discussion of the second person. Then we move on to the third person, the third, sorry, the, the, the second uh, situation. Now we move on to the third situation, which is وَالتَّارِقُ لِدِينِهِ الْمُفَارِقُ لِلْجَمَاعَةِ Which is the one who abandons his religion. وَالتَّارِقُ لِدِينِهِ The Sheikh says, this applies to uh, that when we speak of the one who abandons his religion this can apply or this can have two meanings there are two explanations for this the first explanation is the one who abandons his religion meaning the one who becomes a murtad he abandons the whole of the religion right so he abandons the whole of islam and with respect to such such a person then his blood is permissible in in the sharia as for the second explanation, is that it refers to a person who abandons a part of his religion. Right? He abandons a part of his religion 
part of which is that he separates from the jama'ah right so he meaning he leaves something from the religion which lead which is a part of abandoning the jama'ah meaning separating from the main body of the muslims and then the sheikh goes on to uh, you know explain uh, he goes on to explain the meaning of this he says for example when uh, we find for example some people they revolt and they separate against the imam right so the so they make rebellion against the imam or the leader of the muslims and as a result of abandoning this aspect of the religion because they've been commanded to you know to be in unity with other muslims behind the imam and to obey the imam so when they abandon this part of the religion and they separate from the main body of the muslims and they they break away from the jama'ah then you know they, they or, or for example they start committing oppression and tyranny and corruption upon, uh, corruption upon the earth then these people have abandoned a part of their religion and they've separated from the jama'ah and it is permissible for the imam and for the muslims to go and to fight and to kill uh, these people right so this is a second uh, group of people that can be referred to in by this hadith right so number 1 at tariq wal dinihi one who abandons his religion so he becomes a murtad right he he, he revokes islam or someone or a group of people who abandon one aspect of islam and as a result of abandoning that aspect of islam they end up separating from the main body of the muslims so this would mean for example like the khawarij the khawarij who uh, separate from from the muslims and from the rulers and break off and you know abandon the jama'a and you know who who, who oppose the, the 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 main body of the muslims so this is what the hadith contains and this shows uh you know, the, 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 all of this shows that um, to abandon the jama'ah and to separate from the jama'ah either by ridda, either by apostasy, or by physically separating from the imam and from the main body of the Muslims, then this is a situation in which these people can be, can be uh, for which they can be fought and for which they can be uh, killed. Okay, now the Sheikh goes on to mention an important uh, point here, which is that when a person falls into these, you know, into any one of these three situations, who has the right to start applying these laws or these hudud? This is for the Imam, the Imam of the Muslims, right? This is for the Imam of the Muslim. It's not permissible just for any person. To come along and say, well, so and so, you know, he committed uh, adultery, and we're going to stone him. This is not permissible. It is only for the Imam to implement and to enforce these uh, Sharia had punishments. Right? So, if a person comes along and he says, look, I saw this person with my own eyes committing adultery, so therefore now I'm going to, you know, he, he, he has to be killed. This, this is haram. It's not permissible to do this. Not permissible. It's for the Imam. This issue was raised to the Imam. Why? Because because uh, it, this is this is the right, and this is something that has been entrusted to the Imam of the Muslims to implement this. And if it wasn't for that, then there would be so much confusion and corruption in the society, right? So this one says, "Well, I saw so and so stealing something. I need to go and chop his hand." This one says, "I saw so and so committing adultery. I'm going to go and you know establish the had upon him." This one says. So you find that this this confusion, this corruption, and all this you know chaos will emerge in the society if it's left to the people to implement these rulings. So this is haram, it's unlawful, it is only for the imam of the Muslims to implement these uh, Sharia rulings upon the, the people in the correct with the correct manner, with the correct procedure. Okay. Now the Sheikh says, if one person was to come along and say, I saw so and so committing zina. And I'm going to establish, you know, now we have to establish the had upon him. He says, this is, this is, this is haram. This is not, poss- this is not permissible. It's not permissible. Uh, because the Sharia has required that four witnesses, four just witnesses, should, you know, should see and witness the action being done with their eyes. 
The Sheikh says that even if three of the most pious and righteous amongst the Muslims, so in a, in a, in a, in a society, three of the most pious, righteous Muslims came along, and they saw with their eyes someone committing adultery. They saw with their eyes. And then they came and they made a claim of adultery against this person. So if they said, this person is an adulterer, and we three saw him with our own eyes, and they came along, these three people would be treated <coughs> as having falsely slandered the person of committing adultery. Right? Because, and then, they would have to be lashed for bringing a false... They, they would have to be... They, 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 would, they would have the had the punishment of a false accusation. Right? Why? Because they falsely... They, they obviously, they accused him, but they didn't bring four witnesses. There's only three of them. Right? So this is because in the Sharia... There has to be four eyewitnesses before someone can be accused of committing uh, adultery and before the had can be established upon such a person. Okay, likewise, anyone, likewise, another example, someone might come along and say, well, so-and-so now, he's become a murtad, he's abandoned his religion, become a Christian, become a Jew, become whatever, and, you know, I am going to establish the had upon him and I'm going to kill him. The... You know, so the, the, the Sheikh says this is not permissible at all. This is not, it's not permissible for any person to come along and to start applying these laws and these, these, the applications of these, of these laws. So therefore, when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, لا يحل دم امرئ مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث that's not, that's not lawful for a blood of Muslim to be taken except in one of three situations. This is for the waliul amr. This is for the ruler or anyone that the ruler delegates to fulfill that responsibility. Right? Uh, it's upon them to implement these laws and, to, and obviously to, to kill whoever is deserving and worthy of being killed. And as for if this was just left to every, you know, everybody in the society or anybody in the society, this would mean a lot of bloodshed, a lot of killing, a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion, a lot of enmity, a lot of hatred, a lot of division within the society, right? This, this, is, what would, this is what it would uh, lead to. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the Sheikh um, then continues and says, um, oh, then the Sheikh, yeah, fin finally he discusses one final matter, which is that if we have a land, for example, where there is no Imam, right? So there's Muslims there, no Imam, and there is no person to implement the rulings then, you know, is it, is it permissible for a Muslim... So now, remember, we're not talking now in a land where there are Muslims and a Muslim ruler exists. That's what, we've, that's what we've just spoken about. We've just said that in a land where there's a Muslim ruler and Muslims, it's not for the Muslims to start go, to, to, to start go and to start to implement the rulings themselves. But what about a situation where you have a land where there are Muslims but there is no ruler? There's no ruler to implement the rulings or anyone to enforce these Sharia rulings. What is the situation then? You know, and who implements the rulings? The answer is that the rulings are not to be enforced. And this is the view of the majority of the scholars. That if there are a group of Muslims in the land, there's no ruler, there's no, you know, nothing like that, then the Muslims are not to enforce these rulings. Why? Because a condi there is a condition that in order for the rulings to be implemented, there has to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a ruler. There has to be a ruler. You know, whether, whether that relates to a life being taken, or wealth being taken, or, or the person's honor being taken. There has to be the condition that the ruler uh, is, is present. And this is only for the imam. So when there is no imam, then it is not permissible for anyone to start going around. Oh, well, we heard so-and-so's, you know, son, he was caught for stealing you know, from Woolworth or something or whatever, or from Boots or whatever. So now we have to go and, you know, chop off his hand. It's not permissible. It's not permissible to do this in a land where there are Muslims, but there is no ruler or, you know, no, no, no waliul amr found. Uh, however, the Sheikh says there is one 
situation that is found where, for example, let's say a person comes along, right, and he comes to someone who's from the people of knowledge or someone who's from the people of you know, rec piety and rectification, and he says, look, I committed something, a sin, obviously, which is a sin that doesn't necessitate the, the punishment of killing. And, for example, I committed zina, for example, right, and I'm not married. Or, for example, I drank some wine. Or, for example, I falsely accused so-and-so person of adultery or fornication, but they were innocent, right? So I did something wrong, and, you know, uh, so, so therefore, lash me. Right? So, in other words, this, this punishment that this person is asking for is a punishment less than killing, less than death. So he comes to someone and says, look, um, you know, the, the shaykh says that this situation here is something that many of the people of knowledge, they say that there's no problem with this. Right? So why? Because this person wants to purify himself of the sin. So if he was lashed, then the sin would be removed from him. Right? And, you know, if, if, he, if, he, if he received that punishment, then the sin would be removed from him. So, uh, so the Sheikh is saying that the people, in, people of knowledge in general, that they, they say that there's, that there's, that there's no harm uh, upon this. There's no, harm up, there's no harm upon this if a person comes along from his own choice and wants to, you know, wants to uh, do this. Okay, and then the Sheikh goes on to explain... Yeah, the, the same point as before that if there's a land and, you know, there's, there's no ruler to be found who can enforce the rulings, then it's not permissible for anyone to start enforcing those rulings, especially those rulings to, that pertain to death, right? Killing of an adulterer, killing of someone who becomes an apostate, killing of a Muslim who takes the life of another Muslim. So it's not for anyone to start, you know, to start enforcing these uh, rulings. And the Sheikh says, we find, for example, in Mecca and the Sahaba, there's no, there's no had the punishments established in, in Makkah. And likewise, many of the scholars, historically speaking, many of the scholars, when they were in, when they were in certain lands, and he gives a specific example in the, in the time of the, uh, the Dawla of the Ubaidiyya, uh, and other such situations where there were scholars, and, but there was, no, you know, there was no like rulers who could enforce the, the, the rulings, the scholars themselves never ever implemented the Hudud. The, especially the, specifically the one to do with killing they never implemented them and the, the sheikh says as for the third situation which is those rulings that are less than killing like the example that we just gave then the sheikh says like for example someone comes to an alim a muslim comes to an alim says look I did such and such I fell into this I you know I, I fell into this sin I, I drank something or I you know whatever then purify me, strike, you know, give me the prescribed punishment and purify me. In that case, uh, the Sheikh says that some of the people of knowledge, they, make, they say that this is, this is fine and this is, this is permissible. However, other scholars say that in everything, there must be an Imam. There must be an Imam uh, present uh, in order for any of these rulings to be, to be implemented. So that's the end of the discussion of the Hadith from Sheikh Salih al-Sheikh. Rabbulullah. And we'll end the lesson there. Inshallah ta'ala, next week we'll go through the explanation of uh, Sheikh Ibn Thameen, rahimahullah, just to give some more angles and some more benefits uh, in relation to this hadith.